Hello, my name is Scott Shambaugh, and the project of my presentation today is evaluation of a Tesla type non moving parts valve for molecular flow. Uh, brief introduction just to give a face to this disembodied voice that you're listening to. Uh, you haven't met me because I'm a dis distance student in the AE grad program. Uh, I did my undergrad in mechanical engineering at USC, uh, and I live out in Denver now. I've never actually been to Purdue, which is a little bit strange, but uh, that's why you haven't seen me. I work full-time in the aerospace industry. Um, usually watch these class lectures and train riding to and from work. Um, and I can't stream it at work, so I'm pre-recording it, putting it up on YouTube. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, some motivation of the project. Um, uh, the broad areas of microfluidics and specifically microfluidic valves. Um, there's a need to control flow. Valves are a common way to do this. Uh, and there's several types of valves available. Uh, bilayer valve, which you can see is the top picture there, where basically one pneumatic tube, uh, control tube uh, compresses a flow tube and restricts flow. An elastic one-way valve, you can think like a, like a flap door that's like a little flapper that seals uh, with high pressure one direction and opens with high pressure in the other, other direction. A plunger valve, which is the bottom picture, uh, which is kind of like a flapper valve, except you can control it pneumatically, uh, whether to open or close. Um, however, these all have uh, at least one of the following problems in that they require active control, input energy, or they have moving parts which can wear out or break. Um, and so in the design space of solving that particular problem is uh, this valve that was invented by none other than Nikola Tesla. Uh, it has no moving parts. Uh, a non-moving parts valve, just a nomenclature, um, and it's pass completely passive with no input energy. The valve is completely dependent on just its geometry. And the basic idea here, uh, it might be easier to see when I blow it up, but uh, flow from the right-hand side to the left-hand side is unimpeded by these the baffles inside the tube, whereas uh, reverse flow splits the flow uh, the baffle split the flow, uh, and half of it comes back around, recirculates and recontacts the uh, the other half of the flow going in the initial direction, um, and impedes flow, causes a huge pressure drop. And so the basic idea is that uh, there's free flow in the forward direction and very high pressure drops in the uh, backward direction. And this asymmetry, uh, this ratio of the pressure drop is called the diodicity. Um, think of uh, like a diode in electric, an electrical circuit where current can flow one direction but can't flow the other direction. Um, and we want high diodicity. If one valve can't do it, we can always chain them together like in the previous one. Uh, and these have a myriad of uses. Uh, you can limit contamination of one fluid into another. You can charge a reservoir um, with a high pressure or vacuum, which is what we're looking at here. And it's also a fundamental building block of a pneumatic quote-unquote circuit. Uh, you can imagine building logic gates uh, if you have several of these diodes hooked up in the right configuration. And so previous research here has fo focused on continuum flow. Um, nothing net yet on near vacuum conditions. And so I'm going to investigate uh, the effectiveness of these non-moving parts valves for uh, near vacuum molecular flow. Uh, basic idea is to set up DSMZ, DSMC for a characteristic valve, look at a range of Newtons and numbers, and run the forward and the reverse case to uh, determine diodicity from the ratio of the pressure drops for both those cases. So here's our valve. Uh, it's based on an optimized design by uh, Gamboa for a, uh, for a continuum flow. Uh, scale down a little bit. Um, the footprint's 1,000 by 800 microns, and the channel width is 100 microns, which I'm choosing as the characteristic scale. Uh, so when Newton's numbers are calculated, it's uh, that 100 microns is characteristic length. Uh, I discretized the curves at 10 micron arc lengths. Uh, you can see over on the right, each of those points is the points of straight line segments. Um, and so pretty smooth. Um, 
But so I set that up in Sparta DSMC. What else? Um, it's a 2D simulation with diatomic nitrogen gas at room temperature and diffuse walls also operating at room temperature. Just a very standard conditions. Uh, the boundary conditions, I specified uh, target pressure at the inlet uh, with no bulk velocity and the outlet was a vacuum with also no bulk velocity. So this is the input range. We looked at Newt's numbers from 0.1 to 1,000. Uh, the 0.1 couldn't complete on our computing cluster. Uh, that's okay. And you put it together and kick it off and this is what you get. Uh, over on the forward side, over on the left side is the forward case. Uh, you can see the particles come in from the left. Um, they fill to expand the volume, but the general trend is to go straight ahead and down to the, down to the right. And directly reverse uh, also fills the vacuum, but it goes straight up, uh, split by the baff baffle, and part of the flow comes back and recirculates around. It's pretty nifty. I like these GIFs. Uh, this is the pressure field for the forward steady state case. Forward steady state results, uh, just for two newtons and numbers. Uh, you can see they match up pretty well. Uh, here's the reverse case. Here's the velocity field in the forward direction and the velocity field in the reverse direction. One thing to note is that uh, these don't change that much for the high newtons and number. Uh, which is uh, fine. Uh, it's indicative that steady state has been reached, um, but it's also indicative that there's not too much circulation around the, the uh, baffle. Uh, when we calculate the diodicity and we plot it all up, this is what we get. Uh, the graph on the right, y-axis is diodicity, uh, x-axis is Newton number, it's a log scale. Uh, and you can see that we're pretty much completely flat with a little bit of noise, but of a diodicity of about 1.13, um, which compares well, well, compares all right to literature. Um, it's in the right range. Uh, Gamboa found diodicity of 1.5, and then Thompson found diodicity of 1 to 1.5, depending on the Reynolds number of the continuum flow. But that's all continuum. So this is new for molecular flow. So for continuum flow, the literature suggests that fluid momentum exchange is the mechanism for this diodicity, um, main mechanism, uh, supported because there's low diodicity at low Reynolds number, which is somewhat of a measure of the momentum of flow versus the viscosity of the flow, um, and higher diodicity at higher Reynolds number. So that makes sense. Uh, but why then would diodicity remain flat for cross its numbers for molecular flow? Uh, I'm still not 100% sure, but a possible idea is that in molecular flow there's much less particle-particle momentum exchange. Um, for example, at using equals 1 along the shortest path of the valve and taking into account the mean free path of the molecule, I only expect about 13 particle-particle collisions from entry to exit, and fewer collisions as you go up the Newton's number scale. Um, so I'm hypothesizing that it's just simply the shape of the valve, that it's uh, you know, it's acting as a pool table and shuttling uh, particles back around towards the entry in the reverse condition more than it does in the forward condition. Maybe. A practical concern is that the pressure drop is about 80% in the forward direction, um, which isn't great. You want pretty much no pressure drop if you can help it. Um, and so wider channels might do this. There might be a lot of wall friction. But I think it's probably an artifact due to the lack of back pressure of the outlet boundary. We're holding into vacuum, um, which we probably shouldn't actually be doing. Um, the steady state solution we found is an actual steady state because in reality the boundary conditions should be evolving with time. The inlet will develop a bulk velocity um, and the outlet will develop a back pressure which will also have its own bulk velocity. And so to find the true steady state solution we should uh, iteratively update the boundary conditions. Uh, at each iteration find the local steady state solution before going on to the next iteration 
and over time we expect we would expect this to converge to a true global steady state solution. Uh, I wasn't find, able to find a way to do this efficiently in Sparta because um, it would have been just too much effort to do manually. Um, with more time, I you know, probably could have thrown together some scripts to make this automatic, automatic process. Um, but with the time constraints, uh, it, you know, I think the current results demonstrate the proof of concept, and uh, I'm happy with it. So future work here would be to get iterative convergence on these boundary conditions working, um, probe lower Newton's numbers so we can compare uh, directly to the continuum results rather than taking on faith that the DSMC approach works. Um, probe the width of the channel, see if that changes things, determine how to quantify the error bars, which I have no idea how to do for DSMC um, on these measurements, and also to change chain multiple valves together once we get single valve working to investigate any compounding effects. Uh, so in conclusion, um, these valves work for molecular flow. Uh, uh, they produce measurable diodicity at near vacuum, which is great. Uh, and I think I'd call that project successful. So thank you for the class this semester. Um, uh, obviously not able to take questions. Uh, I wouldn't recommend leaving a YouTube comment. Instead, if you want to talk, feel free to reach out to me. Here's my email. Thank you.